In her collection, as I was saying, Marion invites the reader into an ongoing conversation, one that at times skims the surface of experience and at others dives deeper. Just as a conversation drifts from one idea to another, so this subject matter flows from light and playful to heart-wrenchingly tragic and true. So before I turn it over to Marion, I'm just going to read one of her poems. Prose. I don't trust prose. Stretching across the page, hiding its secrets and all those words. It's too plausible, like a lounge lizard or a used car salesman. Not like poetry with its ragged, econ urgent economy in your face, communicating whether you like it or not. And I'll just get that off the screen there so that you should all be able to see Marion now. We'll just make sure you're spotlighted. And there you go. Thank you, Shannon, for your reading, generous introduction and all your hard work and Lauren's. And many thanks to Dufferin County and Orangeville Library for this opportunity during Poetry Month. Hello, everybody. My name is Marion and I'm a poet. Welcome to Poetry, a conversation for one. During our time together, I'd like to focus with you on that remarkable connection that I believe exists particularly in poetry between writer and reader and revolves around voice. That voice the poet hears while writing and the reader hears while reading. Of course, most of the time that voice is silent to outsiders. It resonates in the poet's head during writing and in the readers as it speaks off the page. At that point, it is a private and very personal conversation. And what the reader may focus on may be just a line, an image conjured by the words or an association that occurs because of them. I'd like to return to that kind of association a little later, but first, I'd like to address the element of voice that you heard as this talk was beginning. You heard Shannon, our hostess, reading my poem, Prose. First though, I hope you read the words silently to yourself. Perhaps as you were reading, you focused on one line, word or idea, and hopefully you also heard a voice in your head that you identified as mine. Then you heard Shannon's voice, and I suspect that even Shannon did not hear the exact intonation of the voice she heard reading silently when she read aloud. I'll tell you in all honesty that even when I read my own work aloud, the voice I hear is not identical to the silent voice I hear when I'm writing. I'll just add here that one reason I wanted Shannon to read the poem to you is because I wanted to open another line of thought related to reading aloud, perhaps a less positive one. I know myself that when I hear a poet read his or her own work, I tend to feel that finally, I am hearing the poem read right. Well, as I just said, when I read my own work aloud, the intonation, emphasis, even sometimes the rhythm of the words can vary from what I hear in my head when I'm writing, even if I practice, and I do practice. I know myself that uh, you may be asking how that could change the way you might understand a poem. Well, think about any poem, song, or play you grew up with that you've heard, read, or seen performed by different people. Did you notice that each brought a different flavor to the character or piece? My favorite example is Hamlet. Though there are innumerable actors and directors who have taken it on and each produces a different play, yet the words stay the same. At this point, 
We'll never know how Shakespeare himself would have read his play aloud, but does that matter? That sense that the poet has some secret connection to his or her, her own work that is the only true one can cause the reader to doubt his or herself. And this damages the connection between writer and reader. It probably also contributes to the myths that can grow up around the poetry that is seen on the printed page rather than heard like lyrics to a popular song or rap. There seems to be a belief out there that the poetry we read is going to be subtle, difficult to comprehend, terribly esoteric, cerebral, embarrassingly emotional, or just plain self-indulgent. Oddly, we can happily sing or quote a poet songwriter or a rapper's lyrics and not worry about whether we're getting it right. But as soon as we look at a printed page, we get all nervous, as though the person who put the words down on paper was a more mystical incarnation of poet than the one who came up with a song or a rap. No, we're all poets. And when you read our stuff or quote it or sing it, you are an absolutely essential part of the conversation. I can't think of any poet who deliberately writes to be obscure, except perhaps T.S. Eliot. And even he never wrote to be misunderstood. He just envisioned an elitist audience who shared his level of education. Poets no more seek to be misunderstood than you do when you jot off a text to someone you care about. Yes, a lot of us do use technical devices that don't show up as regularly in every line of prose, but equally, a lot of our lines are as straightforward as we can make them. And we use devices largely to underline rather than to obscure our subject matter. We kind of hope they'll assist your enjoyment rather than worry you as you read. But the thing is, poetry is by and large short, compressed, if you will. Every word becomes more important since you usually don't plan to use many words to share an idea. Generally, there are just a few ideas at most that poets want to focus on, even only one. And we try to find as many ways as possible to speak to you about it. We may build pictures with our words or appeal to your five senses or even your sixth. Or we may say it's like that. That being something we're pretty confident you're, you'll relate to. A lot of us, and certainly myself as poet, use rhythms where music is a part of our experience and some of us use rhyme to make a line more memorable. So a number of fascinating things occur through the layered process of reading when you're conversing with a poet. Ideally, you will hold words and phrases, images, rhythms, and devices in your head that you associate with a particular poem, one you have made your own. Perhaps you'll even remember those devices affectionately at other times. Now, you may be asking yourself, if I'm so important, what does she mean by a conversation for one? I hope you are asking that question because this is where I intend to address it. Now, I don't want anyone running away with the idea that I'm going to suggest that poets are borderline schizophrenics. Not that we can't be, just what I do want to propose is that most poets, and certainly myself when I'm writing, are writing with a listener in mind. That's not to say we're writing with publication in mind. That's something quite different and something that may not produce our best work. When we write, I believe that we're talking to someone. Now, here, I'm going to stop speaking collectively. 
I probably have no right to do so anyway, and tell you about that listener, that you, I write to myself when I write poetry. My listener may be a real person, someone I actually know, who has a name and a face, but most often my listener is you, the second person, but not a collective you, not a group, but a single person. I imagine this person is someone I know well and like, a friend who may disagree with me, but is interested in what I have to say, and who in a moment will bring his or her own ideas into the mix that is our conversation. This poor person is unshockable. I can say anything to them. We can laugh and be silly together or visit each other's darkest places. This friend always gets my jokes and never has any difficulty figuring out what I'm driving at. By the way, I usually am driving at something. Most of my poet poems wind up at that place. But I have to say in passing that if you read or hear my work and a tiny piece of it resonates for you, it doesn't worry me that you, unlike my invisible friend, don't mesh with me at the end. As I'm writing, I'm tossing my words out into the ocean that exists in my own mind and conversing with that odd listener who is and is not me. By the way, I need to mention here that the poem that began our conversation, Prose, was intended to be hung in cheek to a certain extent. For all the prose lovers who may have been offended by it, I hasten to say that my life would be a bleak thing indeed without the books that fill my Kindle and my personal library. What I did want to do, and I know I'm doing what I said I wouldn't, and telling you what I intended to do with the poem, but what I did want to do was talk about the essential immediacy and intensity of poetry. I hope I did there. So that's kind of what I'm going for in my own work. Here, I feel the need to quote or possibly misquote Oscar Wilde. Be yourself. Everyone else is taken. I want to talk about the connection I try to make with my listener and how I try to do it. There are as many styles and schools of poetry as there are poets. And there are also any number of folks who will tell you what they think is good and what they think is bad poetry. Well, I'm not Wordsworth, Shelley, or Ezra Pound. I really don't feel qualified to pronounce definitively what is good or bad poetry for everyone, and every writer even. However, I feel pretty confident that I, I can say at least what's my own bad poetry. And especially for any new poets out there, these poems that I think were bad poems hit the trash can. They were self-conscious. If I'm looking over my own shoulder and admiring or detesting my words, I'm getting away from what I should be doing writing to my listener. Lacking direction. They didn't move toward a message. Awkwardly phrased. The words didn't do the work. Too wordy. Too many words chasing just a few ideas. Too full of ornamentation. The literary devices that I chose didn't serve a purpose. Inconsistent in their rhythm and musicality. Musicians will get this. The words didn't flow easily and smoothly. There was dissonance. Unfinished. 
Rightly or wrongly, there's a moment when I'm writing that I feel my poem is done. That I've got where I want it to go, whether the poem is a couple of lines long or a couple of pages. I think cooks and bakers get that feeling too. That sense that something is ready to come out of the oven, even if the bell hasn't dinged. In no sense do I want to say that even the poems in my book are all good. But I'm fairly happy to say that for me at least, they're not bad. I feel content with them. Each one says something that I wanted to say. I was ready to let them be heard by my listener. This brings us back to the issue of voice, the poet's voice, and this, at least in part, is what Oscar Wilde was talking about when he counseled us to be ourselves, and Shakespeare's Polonius when he advised his son to thine own self be true. To be heard, we need to find and confidently use our own voices. Each and every one of us speaks in a voice that is as distinctive as our fingerprint. Ask yourself, when I hear my best friend, my mother or dad, my spouse or my lover on the phone, do I ever need to give them, do I ever need them to give their names after they say hello? Well, probably not. Their voices are imprinted on you and they are unique. Just as voices can be heard through a phone, they can be heard off the page. Oddly enough, when it comes to writing, some poets like me take a long time to grow that special poetic voice that is consistent through every poem and has sufficient strength to be recognizable. We tend to feel unsure of ourselves and borrow the style and phrasing of writers we admire. Not a bad idea for a while. That's a kind of apprenticeship common to all art forms, but we need to relax, recognize, and value that which is ours alone when we see or hear it. Singers sometimes speak of a similar experience in discovering their voices. A soprano once told me about the thrill of discovering her top notes in a lesson one day. The voice is there. We just need to find it and use it so often that we don't need to think about it. In fact, once it's there, probably the less we think or worry about it, the better. I stumbled on my voice by accident. I was cuddling my son, who was four at the time, and I started to hear words in my head. They used a vocabulary of devices over a rhymeless rhythm that I now know is my poet's voice speaking. Although it was tempting at the time to put my four-year-old son down on the sofa and run for the phone to book a psychiatrist's appointment, I held the poem in my head and wrote it down later. This is my poem, Four. Right now, we're taking a break from no. Through the fingers stuffed in your mouth, you are singing. Right now, the caretaker of your dreams, I hold them in my hand, delicate as dandelion seeds, sparkling in the sun. Right now, a tuft of silky hair touches the side of my nose. Your knee is firmly planted in my stomach as the fingers not in your mouth scamper up and down my cheek, exploring the infinite dimensions of the room in my heart called womb. As my poet voice became a comfortable part of me, poems began to find me on a regular basis. 
Sometimes when I was on my way to sleep, sometimes just as I was waking up, especially when I was reflecting on a past experience or something that I'd noticed that struck me as odd or interesting or funny, or when I was working my way through one of those things. In other words, all the stuff that comes up when you're talking to a friend, I'd hear the word shift and adjust as I woke up, and I'd be left feeling I had something to say that was true, at least for me, and at least at that point in time. Once you have your voice, it's natural to want to talk to someone, and ideally to hear from them. Over time, since my collection has been published, I've been hearing from readers. Some have spoken to me, several have written to me, and some in reviews have told me about the process they've gone through reading my work. One of the loveliest such reviews came from Dr. Christine York, a lecturer at Carleton University. And because it introduces both my poetry as speaker and my reader as listener, I'd like you to hear some of that review now. These are Christine's words. I'm not a poetry reader, so I wasn't quite sure how to approach this book. I just kept picking it up now and then to read a couple of poems, and they accompanied me throughout my day. That was appropriate, as Marion writes about everyday life, the joy and desperation of going from one day to the next. As I read, I wondered which poem would be mine, as she said in an interview that there's a poem for everyone. Was it, I was yours? about the moment when you become a mother and everything is different. Or one of the painful ones about the teenage years. Or aging, humorous and evocative. I hasten to say here that I have a misconception I actually nurtured for a while that I could find one of the poems in my book that would appeal strongly to each reader. It was a game I admit to playing to underline the fact that my book is a bit of a mixed bag of topics. But in fact, what I was trying to say was that there really is someone's poem out there that will appeal deeply to you especially. Maybe you've already found it. But I think I owe it to Christine to read the two she mentioned and one she alluded to now. She never did tell me if she found the one poem around my, uh, among mine, but as I continue to read, I'll also share some of mine to which others of my readers have responded strongly and some of the stories around those close connections. The first poem that Christine mentioned, the one about motherhood, is I Was Yours. I was yours from the first cry. You lay swallowed in a blue blanket, a white cotton cap jammed on your head like a candle extinguisher. Your brow furrowed, your misty blue eyes squinting against the light. It was a full five minutes before I saw you and caught the intensity of that frown. Even then, you needed to figure things out. Still, the only sound you could make was as individual as your tiny fingerprint. I could pick out that sound from 20 others. Strong, urgent, demanding, deep, I guess I knew right away how it would be. You were yourself and I was yours. She mentioned a poem about the teenage years and it's very possible, although she didn't tell me, that this might have been the one that she was thinking about. I call the poem Dogs. 
When I had a dog, I wore youth as an ill-fitting garment. Clumsy, I was always bumping into life, scratching myself on its jagged edges. Perpetually astonished to watch crimson drops as they disappeared into dust. He was grace itself, whirling loose from his collar, cutting through sunlight, turning on a dime. Accomplished, he'd dive after ducks in bright water. When they bobbed up like corks, he'd laugh. People live longer than dogs. The third poem she, read, she mentioned, Aging, as being humorous and evocative, is this one. Wondering what kind of old woman I'll be seems a matter of geography and cliches at the moment. Will I be old from Montreal or Manhattan? Sharp-eyed, spare, chic, knowing, sophisticated, slim gone to skin getting around in sleek black suits to symphonies and openings in cabs. Or all from the Midwest, perpetually baking, my body a pillow, a cozy country for grandchildren to settle in. Or will I be old from the West Coast in caftans, my long hair loose, or coming out of a bun, up on natural medicines, into crafts, eccentric, drying my own herbs, wishing I was native, hoping I won't be bowery old, vacant eyed, lost in two or three coats, a dirty felt hat jammed on my head, begging as I snarl abuse at passers-by between ramblings. But it's more curiosity than fear at the moment. There are many reasons why one poem will resonate particularly, as many as there are readers. But there are aspects of poetry that may pull a reader in more quickly and more strongly than most prose can. One of the most powerful is the fact that poetry can trigger an emotional response in its readers. That appeal may not, and in my case, is not deliberate, and possibly is strongest when it isn't conscious, but is simply the result of shared experience. The poems, I Was Yours and Dogs, work that way, I think, as does quite a bit of my poetry. Very possibly because I'm writing to that listener out there who is such a good and empathetic friend. There are at least two poems in my book that have garnered incredibly strong responses from some readers. And interestingly, they are two of the shortest. One is a response to parenting. One is a love poem. There are actually not many love poems in my collection, which some find odd, as it is, of course, one of the two favorite themes among poets. I can be accused of pulling in the second great theme into both poems as well. I'll leave that to you to discover. But first, I'll share my poem, Being a Parent. Being a Parent. You greet with astonishment the knowledge not only that you would give your life for that life, but that your greatest fear is that you may be prevented from making the trade. Of all my poems, that one seems to pick up the most responses of I've been there I know what you're talking about from listeners, both dads and mums, when I've shared it. Parents just nod. 
we know what we do for our children, but the slightest hesitation. The love poem actually grew out of a training exercise I was asked to do, in common with several others in a group. We had gathered at our church to train as visitors to those who had experienced great loss or were ill or even dying. We were asked to write five words on a piece of paper. These could be the things we held most dear to our hearts, our names. We had to list them in ascending order. The last would name that which we held closest to our hearts. The group leader continued her lecture on aspects of empathy, occasionally breaking off to tell us when to cross another name or word off our list. When we got to the last one, most of us were in tears. Lesson learned. The poem entered my mind as I was walking home in shock without you. Without you, it would be as though my decapitated head sat alone on an island of granite, still able to feel agonizing pain in my heart, suffering the hunger of my lost body, howling its grief forever to the four winds. In both cases, for someone who's been there, the emotional response is not surprising. But you never really know when some little moment in one of your poems will trigger an extraordinary response in a reader or a listener. Well, you know yourself when you're talking to that special friend. One of you may say something that causes an emotional storm in the other. Perhaps you mention a place you've been, or a glimpse of something you saw on the way. Or maybe you remember the smell of your mom's cinnamon buns, or a taste of a chocolate orange, or the feel of your granddad's beard. One of the strongest emotional responses I've had to a poem came when my husband and I were visiting a friend one night and were introduced to a new friend of his. She and I were making conversation after dinner together, and I happened to show her my poem, Summer in Saskatchewan. She started to cry. It turned out that one of the images resurrected her childhood so intensely that it brought her to tears. This is the poem. Summer in Saskatchewan smelled of heat dust, caragana hedges, and hot, dry flowers, sweet peas, sweet william, bachelor's buttons, carnations, and lilac blooms left over from spring that hadn't lost their fragrance before the unrelenting sun baked them on the branch of sweat and gas cans for lawnmowers lugged by dads and granddads out of cool dirt floor garages. Of me and my brother playing hide and seek with the neighbor's kids, crouching in cubbies in the lilac trees or the cool garages. I see ya, quick jolt of surprise and then a race through the shadows home. We use our senses to comprehend experience. It's natural to appeal to them to convey it. I know myself that some of my most vivid memories are soaked through with sights, sounds, and smells. Growing up, my brother and I spent a lot of time in Saskatchewan with our mother's parents 
in their house that is now part of Saskatoon. One day, I found myself back in that house, walking from room to room in what became my poem, The Mind Must Have a Nose. The mind must have a nose because Today, I smell my grandparents' house. Earth, oil, sweat, garage. Mold, damp, dust, bottled sweetness, cellar. Wet raincoats, hot days, coconut, stale cookies. Butter, cedar, lavender, bleach, iron sheets, bedroom. Christmas, never completely over, even in July. Spruce and secrets. You know, that house has been gone 30 years. More recently, a friend told me that his favourite poem in the book struck a chord through its depiction of the process of ageing as a Newfoundland harbour. And it was one image from it that stayed with him. Although my theme was ageing, I was writing in the persona of my mother. In her last years, she seemed to tire very easily, often falling asleep in her chair. One of her friends put it as, she's slowing down. I called my poem lately. Lately, I seem to be getting slower at everything. Slower to dress, slower to, fit, to finish thinking slow. It's always half an hour later than I thought it was. Aging then must be like a Newfoundland harbour where you watch the ice flows day after day, sailing together, sailing, till you wake up one morning still surprised to see Frieza. So there are any number of shared visions of life that bring us closer to one another. There are a myriad of philosophical views about poetry and how to write it out there for new and not so new poets. I hope you keep exploring and that those of you who've been nervous about poetry may feel less so having begun to think about it in varied ways. And yes, I do believe that there's a poem out there that you'll call your own, that you may even memorize in part or in whole, that you'll keep coming back to. If you haven't found your special one already. But right now, I'd like to close on perhaps a lighter note with another poem that has apparently found following, one that I have to admit I relived in the process of building this talk for you listeners today. And that's my poem, Procrastination. Procrastination certainly makes life exciting. Gnawing guilt, sense of dread, as a thing yet to be done, whispers somewhere, you'll never get me done, I'll tell. It wakes you up at night, feeds your dreams with fear, follows you through the day, jeering. Then, seductively, it leaves you to the blotters out, giggling, go ahead, there's always time later. One thing it never does, though, is the work.
Thank you all for joining me. Thank you, Marianne. Wow, I'm still just, you know, taking it all in and your poems invoke so much emotion. They invoke memories, as you, you were mentioning. Uh, they get us to think of our own lives and especially in the range of poems that you do, you cover the lifespan so that there is um, elements of the different poems or just different poems that resonate with all of us in different ways. And I find that's one of the most fascinating things about poetry is that you can pick up a poem at one time in your life and maybe connect with it for one reason or maybe not connect with it and then pick it up again at a later time and find more meaning a new meaning um, in the very same words. Uh, one of the most common misconceptions about poetry is that you have to, um, like you were saying, find and understand the poet's voice or maybe solve the poem, kind of figure out what it is that the poet was trying to get you to take from it. And you were saying that we don't have to do that. We can let go and we can just read the poem and see how we connect with it and how we resonate with it. And I thought that was really great advice to encourage us uh, to read poetry. And like you said, keep going until we find the one that speaks to us. Now, I know that you taught poetry for decades, um, but you didn't start writing it right away. So I wondered what came first? Was it, did you always have this desire to write, but you just never had the words? Or did the words come first, like in your poem four, that then just fueled that desire to write? I don't think I ever really wanted to write. Uh, I, I think I just found myself doing it. Uh, certainly, like everyone, I had the work to do when I was in high school and university and the papers to put out. Uh, but as I was going uh, through school, especially in university as a student of English, I was studying more and more poetry. And so I started to experiment. And at that point, I started writing very self-conscious poetry uh, that I, I can't even remember now. <laughs> and it's probably just as well that I can't. But uh, from time to time, you know, I, I would write poetry, but it never seemed to come easily until that poem four that I mentioned to you. So to those of you who are listening, if you have any questions for Marianne, feel free uh, to just raise your virtual hand there and we'll call on you and you can unmute. Or you can pop your questions into the chat and I'll make sure to relay them to Marianne. And just while we're waiting for a few uh, questions to come through, hopefully everyone's not feeling shy today. Um, I did wonder as I was reading through uh, your collection and thinking again about how poems can say so much in so, in so few words, um, it must be difficult to then find a title for your poems, I imagine. And I wonder if you could just speak to that and how you find those titles. Do the titles sometimes come first and the poem after or how that works? Uh as you said, sometimes the, the titles come first, sometimes uh, the poem after. Often the title of the poem is a lead into the poem um, and is the first line of the poem. And uh, I, I don't know whether that's really a conscious device of mine, but I, I know that it is a device. And, uh, and I hope that the name that I give a poem also takes the reader into the poem. I've heard um, other poets explain how when they're writing, and you mentioned this in the beginning of your talk, when they're writing with the intention to be published, or maybe because someone has made a request of them to write a specific piece of poetry, that that's more difficult and that they sort of lose that authenticity that is what makes usually poems so meaningful and so special to the reader. And I'm just going to open up your book here because I know you mentioned that in your first poem, and it's called Write Me a Poem, and I wonder if you would share that one with us as well. <laughs> Sure. Um, that actually uh, is par in part a recollection, but it all also was in part a requested poem um, because my publisher actually asked me for an additional poem if he was going to put prose on the back of the book. And uh, it was uh, it was kind of like, well, is it going to go in the back of the book or should I put it in in the book and if I put it in the book what's on the back and uh, so he said well can you write me another poem and I thought about that write me a poem 
he said. And I said, I'd love to, but that isn't how it works. Poetry wakes you up at night or grabs your mind in the daytime and shakes your imagination until you forget about sleep or work in the struggle to wind the twisting words into a shape you hope will bind them with meaning. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Oh, we just so had This is not always instinctive. <laughs> so Catherine has just shared in the chat here. Thank you, Mary, and I've enjoyed reading your poetry, but found that hearing you read your poems gives them another dimension. What have you found to be the most inspiring poem that you have written? That I have written or that I've read? That you have written. <laughs> you can also tell us about the most inspiring one you've read, too, because then we can all read that one as well. <laughs> Well, thank you, Kathy. Uh, actually, I'm going to answer your question two ways because I do have a poem that I'd say is my poem. Uh, and it may surprise you because it's uh, it's not classical. It's, it's not particularly uh, literary. It's not necessarily part of the literary uh, uh, genre, but it is short. <laughs> and it's by Leonard Cohen, and the poem is called For Anne. Um, I think the poem resonated with me because in many ways it does what I hope sometimes my poetry does. It's very tight, it's very concise, and it contains a myriad of, of emotions together. And the poem goes, with Annie gone, whose eyes to compare to the morning sun? Not that I did compare, but I do compare now that she's gone. Mm. And of course, as a love poem, I think it contains all kinds of aspects of love together. And it also stresses the importance of every single word in a poem, revolving a lot even around that verb, did and do. Uh, now, you're asking me for the poem in my book that resonates most deeply with me. Um, well, you know, they're all, they're all touching different sides and different places and different times. Um, it's kind of a tie between without you and being a parent. And both of those poems, of course, are written with the dearest two people in my life in mind. So obviously they're going to be close to my heart. I'm not sure where that sound is, um, but for those of us who might be considering writing poetry or maybe have never tried it, but now you've inspired us to try it, what, what sort of advice would you give? The best advice is the, the advice that Oscar Wilde gave, you know, be yourself. Everyone else is taken. Um, the best voice is your own voice. The more you try to imitate someone else, the more artificial your writing is going to sound. If you want your, your poetry to sound genuine, if you want it to sound sincere, you have to listen for that voice that's yours. And you know, it, it may not come to you in the same way that mine did, and maybe it's come to you already, and maybe you've had it at your, at your fingertips and in your head for a long time. But uh, always listen to what it's telling you if it's telling you that there are too many words, go back and look again. If it's telling you that you're, they're not your words, find your words. And that's the best advice I can give you. You describe impact and immediacy as two critical aspects of effective writing. And I just wonder if you could elaborate on that for us. Well, impact is the impact is the impact that the poem has on the listener, 
and uh, and obviously that can come from just one or two lines or one or two words or from the poem as a whole uh, or from you know the end that the the message that the poem the poet is sending out um, immediacy i think is that sense that you are there with the poet that you've either been there or you are there and you're feeling what that poet is feeling or in the space that the poet is or laughing at what the poet is laughing at uh, you're seeing what they're seeing your senses are coming to bear on their experience so it's really invoking like you were saying earlier those senses into your writing and, and creating those images in people's mind and those feelings and those sights with the words that you're choosing to use I hope so, yeah. And do, does anyone else have any more questions for Marianne or any more comments as we're coming to the end of her presentation? Everybody, you don't have to agree with me, you know. Well, I'll, <laughs> I'll accept disagreement here. <laughs> Patsy has shared. I love thinking of myself as the empathetic friend of the poet. Your poems were amazing. Thanks for reading to me. I would love a copy of Procrastination to share with my family. And is it possible to borrow or purchase your poetry? <laughs> so nice of you to ask. Uh, yes, uh, my poems are in a collection and Procrastination is in there. Um, the name of my collection is As I Was Saying, and it is available from Amazon. You can also uh, Hopefully one day when the store is open again, uh, walk into chapters somewhere sometime and find it. Uh, it is in bookstores. Um, it is uh, sold through Ingram. So even if you're not in Canada, there are, uh, in fact, I'd say a lot of sales do not occur in Canada. Um, but if you're not in Canada, you can go through any of the usual booksellers outlets and find it, or you can, uh, and they would love it if you would, order directly from my publisher, which is Friesen Press, and that's F-R-I-E-S-E-N-P-R-E-S-S. -E -E and thanks for asking. <laughs> I'll just pop that into the chat, and I think uh, Lauren's also going to pop your website into the chat as well so that people can continue to follow your work and uh, just stay up to date with everything that you are doing and all that you are writing. That's wonderful. And I don't see any more comments coming through, any more questions. I'll just let Lauren get the website in there for us. There we go. That should link everyone to your website. And I just want to thank you once again, Marion. You really, you made poetry come alive for us here at the Orangeville Public Library as we are celebrating Poetry Month. And like Catherine and Kathy were saying, just to hear you perform the poems um, just adds such a level of, you know, meaning to all of it. And I just think it was so beautiful to hear you read your own words. So thank you for sharing your time with us and your talent. Thank you, Jeanne. And thank you to all of you for coming. Thank <laughs> you.